So the way they is a very long um, We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, um, Professor Megan Murray, who I think is known to many of you. And I did prepare um, an introduction, so I wanted to start a bit high level. So Megan is the Johnston and Stryker Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine here in our department. She's an infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist whose research focuses on TB management and control. Yes, that, this. There. Uh, particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, Megan has over 200 publications to date, is currently the PI of at least four major research grants totaling over $50 million in research funding, um, has supported 38 students, although I think that's a really unfair undercount because um, in my experience, Megan is incredibly generous in informal ways that are important to students' trajectories. Um, as I was thinking about my introduction for Megan, I always say these introductions are nice if you can find out things about the person that you can't just Google. Um, and so I wanted to share a personal story that really relates um, to this talk and I think um, Example makes an example of, of why Megan is so passionate about this area. So about two and a half years ago, I was um, halfway through my pregnancy with my second child, and <laughs> Megan asked me to start meeting with her weekly so that I could be well prepared to have a very quiet and restful maternity leave, but also that I was prepared that on the other side of the leave to hit the ground running, that there was going to be as seamless a transition um, professionally as possible. And so in those meetings, we realized that there were three grant deadlines that were going to fall over my maternity leave um, that weren't flexible at all. And as the due date got closer, what we realized is we had gotten so much progress done, but there was about five hours of dotting of I's and crossing of T's that needed to happen prior, just in the weeks prior to submission, just those last letters, um, the last sign-offs from the grants office. And what Megan advised me is put these on the shelf, and if during your leave you decide you don't want to revisit that, that's success. However, if you decide on your leave that you want to do those five hours of work, I'm there for you and I'll help you get it submitted. So about two months into my leave, Megan and her husband Sam came to visit us and with a handmade baby blanket, which I can't figure out how, <laughs> she has $50 million of research funding and knitting blankets, but <laughs> that's how she manages. Um, so Megan came to visit us and at the end of the visit, I actually broached with her, I think I want to see these submissions through. And so we started the process and what we found was um, maternity leave for women is medical leave. And so all of a sudden we were hitting these barriers of the department not legally being able to submit the grant materials because I was on a medical leave as ordained by the human resources department. Um, and it really was, it's an HR policy. The interesting contrast for that is when men go on paternity leave, which is an equal policy at Harvard, it is not a medical leave, it is an administrative leave, and they can get those types of supports. Um, ultimately, we found a solution to help me get those grants in that worked um, for the legal issues and for our department. But I think Megan and I were both just kind of stunned and outraged by this. I was too tired to really do much more about it. But Megan started you know, really shaking cages in the HR department and with our school's administration to help them recognize this disparity that existed in LEAD. Um, so I think that really simplifies both Megan's commitment as a scientist, helping me write the best grants possible, as a dedicated mentor, as an advocate both for her um, trainees, but also for the populations that she serves with her researcher. And I definitely think of her as our resident cage shaker for gender <laughs> equity within the medical school and with Harvard um, and the research community more broadly. So thank you, Megan, for speaking on this. Well, I really appreciate the introduction because actually I'm, I'm super nervous. Um, I give lots of talks, but rarely are they personal. And, um, 
I probably wouldn't have got into giving a personal talk at all. I think when Scott asked me a couple, maybe a year ago, do you want to give a talk? I said, sure, I've got lots of TV talks up my sleeve. But then our friend Sartak uh, Sartak Das, who some of you may know, asked me to come and give a keynote presentation in India at a very local um, conference this fall. And I said, sure, yeah, of course. And then I was surprised to find that um, the topic had already been established, and it was one that I wasn't really prepared to give a talk on. And it was this. It was barriers, gendered barriers to women's leadership in medicine. So I thought, oh my god, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on barriers to women's leadership in medicine. And then on second thought, I thought, well, we're all experts on our own lives, right? Um, even though people tell us we're not. Uh, <laughs> so I can talk about my own life, and I will do a little bit of research and see how consistent my experience has been with other people's experience. And, and what I found, which is probably is no surprise to most of you, but, but some of this really was a surprise to me, is that every <coughs> obstacle I faced at any point in my entire career had also been faced by lots of other people and had been now written about and talked about. So let me start. Um, Oh dear. <laughs> How do I make this? <laughs> um, nah. Okay. I, I don't know how to advance the slides. Try that. There. There's a little locked button in the yeah. corner up there. That looks ominous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, could somebody, um, you know, if I do this, give me a hand. Um, It won't advance. Uh, it's got a lot. No, it's got a lot. Hey, what about this? Hmm. Well, we try it again. It's got this pen. What about this? It's that. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is that? There we go. Okay, so, so <laughs> at the age of about eight, maybe I was seven, I don't know. That's, that was me. Um, I realized I hated science. Um, and I didn't just, you know, didn't just, it wasn't just like, I don't like science, I don't want to be a scientist, I hated science, I loathed science. And I can remember the very day that I started to loathe science. So I was in fourth grade, maybe, we were talking about energy, and I understood the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy, and then the teacher started talking about electrical energy, and uh, then I got a little bit lost. They were talking, he said, there's these little negative charges, and they move through wires, and they turn on lights, or something like that. I mean, <laughs> I said, you know, I don't, I don't understand what you mean by a charge. It's like a little negative sign, just like that, right? So it's like a negative sign? I mean, I probably didn't say that. I probably sat there quietly. I went home. I asked my dad, what do you mean there's little negative signs and wires? So yeah, there's little negative signs and wires. <laughs> and I remember just getting angry and saying, I just don't believe there's negative signs in wires. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so uh, they all told me I was really stupid, and I believed them. And that was more or less the end of it. Um, all the boys in the class didn't seem to have a problem with this. This wasn't my class, but you can see they're all raising their hands, <laughs> answering questions nicely, and all the girls are sitting there quietly. This is probably the 40s, not the 60s, but, um, but there you have it. So uh, it turns out that I am not the first young uh, eight-year-old who um, got lost interest in science and math. This is a study done a couple of years ago in 2015 in Israel where um, teacher bias in science and math uh, against girls was measured. And the way they measured it was by um, looking at the grades that teachers had given students in math and other areas in class and then comparing it to a year-end um, state exam that all the kids were administered and which was blinded to gender. And so if the people did better on the state exam than in their class exam, that was considered a way to measure teacher bias. Right? And what you see is that girls, uh, the negative scores means that they did better on the state exam. Girls did better on uh, the state, uh, state exam than on the teacher's exams. But they did a little better in language, so Hebrew and English. So perhaps not surprising. The consequence of that was that girls uh, who were in classes with uh, taught by teachers in, who had greater bias measures 
were much less likely to go on to do uh, advanced math and science than girls in classes who were teachers were not biased. <laughs> and as the um, authors conclude, the biased behavior at early stages of the schooling can have long-term implications on occupational choices because you need to have math and science to go on to do that uh, later in life. So I um, got transferred to a girls' school not long after that. Um, this isn't my girls' school, but um, <laughs> it could have been because we all wore uniforms. And uh, I was really happy because not only were there not pesky little boys raising their hands all the time, but we actually just didn't do science in that school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we did a little math, but between the ages of about fifth grade and you know, maybe eighth or ninth grade, I don't remember learning a single thing, and it didn't bother me in the least. I was quite pleased. Um, and I probably would have never gone on to do anything <coughs> in science had it not been for a, a sort of peculiar uh, feature of my family. Um, when I was 14, my um, father, uh, who was a cardiologist at the University of Minnesota, decided to take us all on a sabbatical with him to um, Niger in Africa. Uh, we bought some Land Rovers, we drove across the Sahara Desert, and we ended up in Niger, which is about uh, here. Uh, here's us driving across the Sahara. Um, <laughs> here we are in Difa. Difa had no schools, um, so and actually had no healthcare professionals except my dad. So all of the three of us kids, my two brothers, worked in the hospital in some manner or other. I, here I am distributing medicines. Uh, and um, after a year in that context, I, I sort of relented a little bit and said, well, maybe I could be interested in medicine. But it wasn't strong enough to get me uh, to major in science or even do pre-med as an undergraduate. I majored in philosophy. And, um, but by the time I graduated, I was interested in doing more work in global health. So, um, like lots of other people back in those days, we didn't have the internet. You know, it was hard to find, figure out where to get a job because they weren't listed somewhere. I sent out probably 70 letters to different NGOs and international organizations. And I heard back from one after about five months, one offering me a job in Thailand, working for the, what was then the Intergovernmental Committee for Migration is now the Inter, um, Intergovernmental Organization for Migration working with uh, refugees in Thailand, helping people be resettled, and in particular doing medical screening, or helping arrange medical screening uh, of people who were going to be resettled in other countries. So when I was offered that job, I was thrilled, because um, I really needed a job. I was living at home, and I really was quite desperate to get out of there. Um, and I didn't mind at all that they, the job that I was being offered was as a volunteer, and, and so we were being barely paid. But I was, uh, you know, I was really happy. And when I got there and found out that the male volunteers were paid more than I was, I wasn't all that upset. This was 1980, um, and it seemed kind of normal. The elderly European um, heads of the program explained that, well, men were going to have to um, support their families once they had families, and that we as women would be supported. So really, the guys were going to make more money than we did. And while we didn't agree, we didn't really, we didn't really bother us that much. Um, eventually, I went on to get be moved from a volunteer position to a professional position. I stayed in town for four years, uh, and then I decided that it was time to think about being a doctor, and I came back and uh, started at Harvard Medical School. So this experience, though, of um, being paid less uh, than male men and having a hard time finding a job, uh, of course, is not specific to me. Um, this is a study. That, looked, that asked science faculty who ran labs how willing they would be to hire a recent graduate. Um, and they sent out a recent graduate's CV, and they asked people, how hireable is this person? And if you did hire them, how much would you pay them? So they randomized the, the faculty they sent the, the letters out to. There were two groups. Uh, one got a CV that was from Jennifer. And one got a CV that was from John, but otherwise these CVs were completely <laughs> identical. So on average, uh, men, um, male students were considered to be more competent than the exact identical woman who was being um, uh, represented on the CV. 
they were considered to be more hireable. Uh, they were considered to be better um, candidates for mentoring. And they would be paid $30,000 or $2,000 versus 26 point something um, by that, those professors on average. So again, uh, it, it, my, I was beginning to realize that my experience wasn't particularly unique. So I started at Harvard Medical School in 1986. Uh, about half my class, a little less than half my class were female. And um, actually I really just didn't, didn't think about gender issues much at all for the first couple of years. And it really didn't come up until I did my surgical rotation at uh, Mass General. So what I didn't know, I guess I hadn't been paying attention, was that no one elected to do their surgical rotation at Mass General compared to the other hospitals um, that one could choose to go to unless one was planning a career in surgery. And in my year, no one was planning a career in surgery unless they were male. So I arrived at this rotation. Um, there were about 25 of us, 24 men, one woman. There was not a single surgical resident in my, uh, it, it, that, was, that I met who was a woman and there was not a single surgical attending. I heard there was a single surgical attending, um, Susan Briggs, who was a burn, uh, burn uh, surgeon, but I didn't see her at all while I was there. So in this two month rotation, it was 100% men and, and then me. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, there, there were a lot of good things about it. The, the, um, I learned a lot. Um, some of the men were very supportive and realized that it's kind of hard to be the only woman in a group of like 150 men. Others were somewhat irritated that a woman would be interested in um, doing surgery at Mass General, especially one that wasn't planning a career in surgery. Uh, so it turns out that I'm not the only woman who found being in a surgical <laughs> rotation difficult. Um, Gender-related perceptions of career <laughs> in surgery among new medical graduates shows that uh, there are very significant sex differences in the perception of surgical careers. Both men and women think that surgery is not a particularly welcoming field for women. And uh, this is a more quantitative study that asked people a series of questions, men and women who were um, interested in surgical careers. In the academic surgical practice, I will probably have a harder time obtaining academic position than people of the opposite sex. Uh, about 38% oh, of women agreed with that statement, whereas only 3% of men did. My gender is currently a barrier to my career aspirations. About 10% um, of men, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, 1% of men said yes. About 20% of women said yes. People's attitudes about my gender are currently a barrier. 1% uh, of men said yes, and about 32% of women said yes. Okay, so I decided not to go in surgery. I went into medicine, and this is not actually, I don't, I can't find myself there, but I think this is probably around the year that I joined, and, and Anne was in this group too, um, that I joined the, the program because the, the faculty all look around the same age as they would have then. Um, <laughs> for those of you who know who Mort Schwartz was, he's here, he was the champion and the, the, the you know, like astonishing infectious disease person of all time, and we had a great, it was a great privilege uh, to work with some of these, these people, and also my fellow classmates, about, about half, a little less than half of whom were, were women, so it felt very um, even. And I had, was again quite happy and didn't really um, perceive a lot of gender related issues up until the time um, that I decided that I should start my family. I was heading towards uh, 34. I thought that the senior year of residency would probably be a good time to try to get pregnant. Um, and so I did. Uh, and what I found was that really there had been a pregnant resident, medical resident, a couple of years earlier. Then they really, this was a surprise and it was a problem for the residency program because they were very, very um, short staffed. And you know, if you went on, uh, uh, took time off, somebody else was going to have to cover it. Uh, it turns out there was no um, maternity leave. One could um, pool vacation time, elective time, uh, and sick leave and take about two months, uh, which I did. What that meant is that the rest of the time one was working kind of full steam um, during the whole pregnancy. And around the sixth or seventh month, um, my, my obstetrician said, you know, your blood pressure is going up. Um, this is not good. 
I said, well, you know, we'll watch it. And then I decided about oh, six weeks before the baby was due that my husband and I would go to the Caribbean for a couple of days, last vacation before we were before we had children. And my doctor said, you can't go. Your blood pressure is now close to preeclampsia and get a monitor it. You can't go anywhere. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> we are going regardless. Like, I'm sure it's going to be fine. So I uh, <laughs> took a blood pressure monitor. And as soon as I got to the beach, my blood pressure fell from something like 140 over 90 to 100 over 60, and I was fine. <laughs> Proving the point, but it turns out that even that super personal uh, medical, you know, story, that I'm not alone. Um, medical residents have complications of pregnancy across the board. Um, hypertension is not uncommon. 10.5% of women residents uh, were hypertensive during pregnancy, compared to 6.3% of other people. And I'm not even showing you the surgical data, but the surgical residents uh, uh, have even higher. Um, of frequency of, of complications. And this is really due to, you know, working 36 hour shifts, being on your feet for 24 hours at a time, not having breaks for food or, or um, drinking, and getting dehydrated. Um, it's, it's all very understandable, but it was something that the programs did not really address. So when I finished my residency, I, I kind of embarked on a really hectic um, six years. I did a clinical infectious disease fellowship in 1994. I got an MPH at the School of Public Health in 95. Started a doctorate in epidemiology in 96. I went on until 2000. Um, I started attending as an infectious disease physician uh, for six weeks a year at Mass General around then. Um, I spent three years teaching infectious disease epi epidemiology at, at BU while I was a graduate student. And then um, during that time, because I had amassed significant <coughs> medical school loans, and in the course of this period, I had two more kids, uh, I needed to work um, to make some money to put my kids through daycare. My husband was a graduate student. Um, he'd been a musician, and when we had our first kid, he said, this isn't going to work. I can't be out late at night, and you're working full time and, and often overnight. So he switched to public health and, and spent another couple of years in graduate school. We had a great deal of debt, and um, I needed to work uh, moonlighting. And I was working about 20 hours a week, doing a Chelsea urgent care for, for seven years. So I passed through this period and then into my assistant professorship. <coughs> so I finally got a job <laughs> at the age of about 40, first real job as an assistant professor at School Public Health um, in 2001. Uh, and I knew from um, what people told me that I was going to have to negotiate um, around what that position looked like. And what I specifically knew was I was going to have to negotiate around salary. So I got a job offer elsewhere. I came back to the school of public health and said, look, I got this other job offer. They said, okay, good. We'll meet it, blah, blah, blah. Right? What I didn't know is that I could really was supposed to be negotiating for more than that. And this is a blog from Science um, Magazine by a guy who was an um, assistant professor who said, in, in 2019, so much later, I learned from my mentors that I could negotiate for much more than salary, startup funds, moving <laughs> costs, parking, parking, let me get, can you imagine parking, um, <laughs> laboratory space, graduate <coughs> research assistance, administrative support, et cetera, teaching loan. So I didn't know that. And I, you know. I, I was happy with what I, well, I wasn't actually all that happy with what I had, but I didn't realize it was different. So I had two other um, uh, assistant professors started in the same period I did, both guys. I knew them pretty well. Um, and uh, I don't know if their salaries were different from mine. I suspect not. I suspect we all started at the same place. But I do know that they were able to start labs. I, I wasn't trying to start a lab, um, and you need some money to start a lab, so I'm sure they're startup packages were higher than mine. I, I was offered $50,000 as a startup package, and you can't really run a lab for that. Uh, and so I, I don't know, <coughs> this is not really widely shared information, but I'm sure their startup packages were, were significantly higher than that. Uh, and I, and that uh, I hadn't really thought about it until that point. So what about for other people? So there's a, a significant pay gap. Um, between gender-related pay gap and medical specialty. So this is physicians, um, and it ranges from the, a low of, say, 4% difference to a high of about 25% difference. 
uh, depending on a subspecialty. And these are, these are mostly practicing clinicians. So I mean, it's kind of random, I think. I mean, the, the smallest wage gap was in hematology and, and even in plastic surgery. And weirdly, the largest ones were in pediatrics and pediatric pulmonology. So I don't know why, but there is a significant um, uh, gender. This is a re relatively recent data uh, from 2018. How about for researchers like us? So this is a, a study um, uh, that came out a couple of years ago, 2012, that looked at the differential between men and women physician researchers. And what they did was they took people who'd won K awards. So a K award is an NIH grant that allows early faculty to get five years of funding. It's very competitive. So they're kind of equalizing the men and women in this by having them be K recipients. And then um, these are K recipients in the year 2000 to 2003. And then in 2009, they asked them what their salaries were. And it turned out that the average female salary in that group was 167 versus um, men was 200, or a little bit more. But of course, there's a lot of differences, right? I mean, they, they made a very complex multi, multiple regression model, uh, controlling for race, age, number of children, marital status, academic rank, meaning assistant, associate, et cetera, um, other graduate degrees, so people with PhDs as well as their MD, specialty, <coughs> Um, years since award, number of publications, number of work hours that people reported. And when you throw all that into a model, that number goes down. But even if men were and women were otherwise identical on all those issues, men would still be making $13,000 a year more um, than men. I think for those of you who are methodologists, I think it's reasonable to ask, should we be controlling for all those things? I mean, I think those are mediators, <laughs> not founders. So, um, but the reality is that the actual number was $30,000 difference. And I think it's really important to think about how that accrues over time. So lots of people have 401, what do they call it? 401 Ks. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the proportion of your salary that's going into your retirement benefits. These accrue over long, long periods of time. So in the, at the end of the day, when women retire, they're not gonna make up this difference, right? This is the difference that's happening um, as we go. So what about, so this is, you know, general. Uh, what about Harvard? Um, there's no good data, as far as I could tell. This is what the Harvard Crimson published it is across the board. I don't know if it includes a medical school. It is, um, and obviously, this is not peer reviewed, and I read the article and it wasn't particularly well documented. So I would take this with a huge grain of salt. Um, they're claiming that for full professors make uh, eight percent less women, um, and for and it goes uh, the the gender gap is uh, lower with um, as people are more junior, to only a four percent gap for assistant professors. But again, I suspect that that's not representative of what happens um, within medicine. Well, I'm not sure. <coughs> okay, so how about startup packages? Um, so as I said, I uh, I got a fifty thousand dollar startup package. Um, the men in my, my world probably got more. And if you asked the school, so what explains that, they would have said something like, you know, different areas need have different requirements, right? So people working in a lab have to buy equipment and the agents to get started and you don't. But the problem is that nobody actually asked me at the time what I intended to do as a professor and what it would cost to do what I intended to do. And, you know, frankly, had they asked me, I probably wouldn't have known. But, um, <laughs> but it turns out, you know, and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, that doing global health is not cheap, and traveling to sites and building sites is not free. Um, so uh, uh, it's something to, to, to think about. Um, okay, this is the shocking, um, the, shock, <laughs> the shock, I think. Here is a um, study of average startup packages for um, academics doing either medical or, or other um, biomedical type sciences, published in JAMA uh, in 2015. At that time, institutional startup for early career, people who had uh, were starting in early careers, 
was $889,000 a year for men, and not a year, for the whole package, versus $350,000 for women. If you um, look at basic versus uh, clinical science, it's really much more extreme in the basic sciences, where the difference was between 980 and 585. Actually, in clinical work, and I think they mean if you're a doctor, if you're doing research around the actual clinical work that you're doing, it, it was not significantly different, but, but actually made, made a little bit more. What's most shocking about it is that the more money that the universities get from the NIH, the more extreme the difference was. So in the top quartile of NIH-funded institutions, men were getting a million forty as startup package, women 368,000. Okay, so how does that compare with us? So, so like, I, I do want to put the caveat here that some that some for some of these numbers, salary was included as part of the startup package. Whereas when we think about here's your salary, here's your startup at, at medical school and school of public health, it's usually those are usually separate. So it's not reasonable to directly compare them. And I don't have numbers for Harvard Medical School. Uh, I tried to ask around and I didn't really get any. I'm not sure they're going to be all that excited about reporting startup packages by gender. So I can only tell you about the ones that um, people have told me about. So this is hearsay, or maybe you could say her say, since most of them come from women. Um, but what I do know is it ranges, it's, it's dramatically different. So on the low side, uh, there are, are junior faculty who get $50,000 um, packages even now, like I did 20 years ago. And on the high side, there are female um, junior faculty who get over a million dollars startup. Um, and so it doesn't seem gender related since almost all those people were women, unless you realize that the, the, in the departments where people <clears throat> tend to get low on the low side, the $50,000 side, they're often dominated by women junior faculty. In the department where there's a handful of women junior faculty, uh, uh, one woman I know was offered 500000 and then in the, a department where this one was going to be the only woman faculty member, she was offered over a million. So it looks like it might not be related to the gender of the faculty member, but more on the gender of the department. Um, and that, of course, is not, uh, these are just several observations. I, I don't know how consistent it is across the board, uh, but it'd be interesting to see that. Okay. So what happens next? Um, you get promoted on the basis of three things three or four things, maybe five. <laughs> Research productivity, meaning how many papers you publish and where, how many citations you get. Grant funding, usually meaning NIH funding, but not always. Reputation, meaning how many talks do you give. And then to a lesser extent, how good your teaching is, and to a much lesser extent, how much service you do for the university. And one of the things that happened to me was that I felt um, that I was extremely unproductive in the first few years of my uh, assistant professorship, far less than I had hoped. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, that's a very common experience, um, that women in general publish less, are cited less, and publish in less prominent places and in less prominent places on the authorship list than men. So here's one piece of data supporting that. Um, this is just the distribution of the number of publications by sex and program, especially in the sciences, but, but also in the humanities. Women publish less, less so in social sciences and whatever applied health is. I'm not sure if we're applied health or not. But um, in applied health, it was a little bit more equal. How about in um, positions? So this is the probability that a woman would be the first author of a, a paper published in one of these top uh, highly rated journals. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it kind of started, this is between um, 1994 and 2015. Uh, it started to decline, the, that there were, um, uh, the probability uh, that a female author would start to go up, and now it's fallen off and plateaued, uh, or, or plateaued. What's also remarkable about it is um, all these other journals, uh, you know, have about 40% chance that a woman's going to be the first author, except the New England Journal of Medicine, which is about a 25% chance that a woman's going to be um, uh, the first author. 
So this has a direct bearing on whether one gets funded uh, on grant applications. This is a study showing the gender gap in early career transitions. Um, this is the probability of failing to receive a grant. So it's a survival curve. If you, um, if you don't, th this is a percentage of people who did not receive a grant. And it's actually pretty high. So most people don't get grants, right? Th this is an R01. Again, this was a, um, this was kind of normalized by taking people who'd gotten training, NIH training grants while they were training and asking how likely was it that they would get a next grant, an R01, within a certain time period. Uh, and that time period goes way out to, to 25 years. Um, and what you see is women get fewer grants. And when they controlled for um, the kinds of, well, a huge range of things that went into that, uh, what they found was that most of that difference is made up by differences in publication records. Uh, publication records explain 60% of the lower rate, and the remaining differential stems from the reduced number of citations, even when women do publish. So this is referred to as the productivity paradox. And there's just an, I mean, I couldn't even begin to cover the whole literature on this because it's vast. But for me, it was kind of crazy that this is a paradox. I mean, to me, and when I was thinking about my first few years as a, as a uh, assistant professor, there was nothing paradoxical about product, reduced productivity. I had three kids, all of whom were under six. Um, I was nursing them, uh, you know, two years apiece all the way through. Um, I was pregnant a good deal of that time. I was in debt and was working an extra 20 hours a week on uh, moonlining as well as whatever uh, um, household stuff we were doing. My husband was a graduate student. Life was hard. Um, and in contrast, I was often comparing myself to the men who started the same time I did. And uh, I don't, you know, I wasn't really looking into it all that deeply, but a number of the, the, but the two that I was thinking of, one had started with a child. Um, it finished an MD-PhD program, which means that he graduated without debt because your MD, if you're an MD-PhD program, is paid for. The other was a PhD and it was also without debt because he had a really good scholarship for that PhD. The second one had a baby during um, the first four or five years, as is reasonable, took his paternity leave, which as Bethany's pointed out, is gives you 13 weeks of paid time off. You don't have to teach. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, these, some of these, quote, family-friendly um, policies produce is that they're shown to actually benefit men more than women. So this is a different family-friendly um, strategy. This is a strategy where your tenure clock is delayed by the number of kids you have. I was exempt from all of that because my kids had been born before I started my assistant professorship. Um, and many people don't take advantage of this anyway because they want to, you know, they want to go through the, pro the process more quickly. But this is a, a, a study that was then written up in the New York Times, and I love this, um, this cartoon because it basically tells the whole story. Women are home, you know, with their babies, they're taking care of them. Sometimes men are home with their babies and they're getting their work done, and because they don't have to teach and do have other commitments, they're able to get a lot more work done. So that these, this group showed that adoption of a gender neutral tenure clock policy reduced female tenure rates. At the same time, it substantially increased male tenure rates. So I'm sure that's not the purpose, um, <laughs> but that's sometimes the, um, the effect. So of course, my, part, my particular problems that um, kids, you know, <laughs> too many kids uh, were, were very, specific to me and there were choices I made. Um, so I tend to think, well, those aren't really gender related um, until I looked at this data. Uh, and this is from Harvard. It's a Harvard survey that was sent out a couple years ago <coughs> where they asked faculty what their work hours were and asked them a bunch of questions. Um, so median hours of work, assistant associate professors, uh, for people who didn't have any kids, they worked a lot of hours, 65 hours a week had relatively little in the way of household duties. As people became child and non-working partner or child and working partner, the number of hours that women spent doing household and child-related tasks increased to about 20 hours a week on top of the 60 hours a week that they were already <coughs> working, same as men. 
but working 80 hours a week versus 60 hours a week um, really does change things quite dramatically um, to, in terms of one's productivity. So I wasn't the only one. Okay, what are other, some other um, explanations of this productivity paradox? Well, there's a whole bunch of theories out there, and some of them range from quirky to interesting. Um, <laughs> one that got Larry Summers into a lot of trouble was this idea that there's a variability, that, that men and women are equally intelligent on average, but that there's much more variability in the bell curve, so the standard errors are wider, uh, and that way out on the extremes, um, there are more guys who are, have really low IQs and more guys who have really high IQs. Okay, I am, you know, I think that's crazy. Uh, let me just say, but we don't have time to go into why it's crazy. Let's just assume it were true, which I don't think it is. Um, and we can we ask the question, so was Larry Summers assuming that all these Harvard professors were in this, like, fourth standard deviation of intelligence? Okay, maybe, we're all geniuses, you know. Um, this is a study done at Cambridge University in England, the, the usually considered the top university in England. Um, it has a especially strong physics program, probably considered the best in the world. And they actually took did IQ tests of a bunch of <laughs> faculty. And they found the average IQ test, you know, IQ of a guy or a woman at this was a, somewhere between 121 and 127. Okay, to be on the fourth, um, standard, you know, the fourth standard error, you have to have an IQ of over 160. So, I mean, I know a lot of smart people, but I have to tell you, I don't think the Harvard, the Harvard Medical School faculty is filled with people who have IQs over 160. I mean, maybe Larry does, but um, <laughs> I don't know. That's one theory. Another theory is it's just really too cold in our offices. <laughs> So this was a study where it was just published where they actually administered math and verbal tests to people at different office temperatures, men and women, right? And I mean, it's kind of remarkable. Like if you, if these are centigrade, so 15 degrees centigrade, women's scores on math tests just go up and up and up until it gets to 35 and then they don't put the heat up any higher than that. <laughs> you know, which maybe explains the variability on the, the IQ test, but, but we don't have to go there. <laughs> Men's goes down a little bit, but not as, um, with not as steep a slope as, as women's. And it's actually true in verbal skills as well, that the, the, the warmer the room, the better women do, the worse that men do. So I asked Jen, <laughs> who's standing out here, <laughs> What temperature we keep the, the office at? <laughs> 68, which is 20 it degrees. Depends. It depends. On the sensors. On the sensors, but it's about 20 degrees centigrade. Right? So we're all like, you know, we all, the women would be performing better in math if we just turned it up. I, I don't know, I'm kind of comfortable right now, but in the summer, I often just have to go outside and go for a walk because I'm so cold, I'm aching. And, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure just getting up and leaving the office it actually contributes to reduced productivity. Um, how about reviews? Okay, so so we know that women publish less. Um, this was a study that was commissioned by the Gates Foundation that found that when they have their grand challenges grants, which are usually for small amounts of money, they blind them to gender, right? So the reviewers don't know the gender, don't know who's, who they're reviewing. And yet, Women were less likely to get grants to be to get good scores on the grants and to be funded than men, and they wanted to know why. So they commissioned these guys. Um, Julian Kolev is at MIT, and these are economists. So what they did was they looked at all the words. They used like you know these fancy text searches, but you can what's it called? Um, natural language processing. Found and took words from these grants and put them in a computer program and asked, is there a difference between the words that men and women use? And it turned out that there was. They looked at 6,800 proposals, identified the top 1,000 words, and found that they differed substantially between what women wrote and what men wrote. And these don't seem all that, you know, they don't seem, it doesn't seem obvious to me. Like, if you use the word brain, if you're a woman, but bacteria, if you're a guy, or, like, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little weird. But, but it turns out, statistically, it's pretty interesting. On this, this is a curve of, of fundability. If you're under this this um, uh, slope, you're less likely, or much more like, less likely, to be funded. And as you can see, there's a lot of pink because these are words that women use, and those words were associated with funding. And words that guys use tend to be associated with being funded. Um, so. 
some of those words seem weird. But this was another study that came out in the BMJ this Christmas. And the BMJ has a Christmas issue, which is mostly to be funny. But this is actually a real study, even though it is a little bit funny. Um, what they did was they went through thousands and thousands of papers, looked at who was the first author, man or woman, and asked, um, are these specific words, which they pre-selected, how often are they used by men and women? And what they found was that men are much more likely to use words like novel, unique, promising, favorable, out there on the social section. You say, wow, I didn't know. You really showed, you showed them. It was novel, unique, promising, and favorable, and robust. The only word in the, in the, uh, that they put in this group that women use more often than men was supportive. <laughs> um, and you know, down there, they didn't use much at all. But it turned out this did matter. So depending on which journal it was, what words you used was associated with how many citations you got. Uh, so in clinical journals <coughs> especially, as compared to other um, journals, and those with the highest inde um, index factor, so the top <coughs> tier of journal, was much more likely, uh, you were much more likely to be cited if you used these grandiose words than if you didn't, right? So something about the way that men are describing their own science or talking about it seems to have an impact on how often they're going to be cited. And they concluded with the question, so what should we do about this? Should we encourage women to call their, their work novel, exciting, promising, and favorable? And they, they actually concluded, no, maybe we should discourage men from using those words. <laughs> uh, how that's going to pan out, I really, it's really hard to say. Um, OK, how about teaching? So we've gone through the main areas of, of criteria for promotion. But teaching, I mean, women are like good teachers, right? We're all caring, and we all you know, support of our students. <laughs> this was a study in the Netherlands that looked at men, the teaching evaluations for men and women teaching the same class. Um, and they compared the teaching evaluations to a independent test done at the end. So there was an exam for the, everybody. These pe people were in different sections, some led by women, some led by men. The exam was the same, graded by somebody other than the instructor. And um, the, all of the materials were identical for both groups, right? It's just, just one set of materials was online. Uh, they compared, they, they rated the teaching evaluations compared to both student final scores and also the number of hours that, in, that people reported spending. So the idea was that maybe a woman was a bad teacher, but you spend twice as long working on it, so you made up for it with your score. So they wanted to adjust for that possibility. The teaching evaluations were worse for women instructors, although there was absolutely no difference in outcomes. Um, the, the worst evaluations were driven by the male students in general, with minus 21% versus minus 8%. <coughs> the students rated the teaching materials, again, identical teaching materials, as worse if they had a female instructor. Um, and the teaching evaluations went on to have a fairly um, significant impact at this university on uh, the professional development of, of, of the faculty. So that's another one. It couldn't possibly happen here, right? Um, <laughs> this is another study, and this was even it was an experiment, in which a, uh, a online course was offered, and people were assigned a teaching um, a instructor who wasn't actually interacting with the with the students. So she didn't talk to them or he didn't talk to them. He just graded their papers and gave them feedback. Materials were uh, completely identical, but they told some students that the teaching instructor's name was Nancy. I'm making this up, but some woman's name. And they told other students that the, the instructor's name was John, kind of making it up. But they randomized with the names. And what they found was that on every single thing that they evaluated their instructors on, who they never met, if they thought it was a guy, they, they got better teaching scores than if they thought it was a woman. So all of these are negative, these differences, and that's because if they perceived, this just, just means that the, the females was evaluated lower than the male. And things like caring, enthusiasm, fairness, responsiveness, etc. In reality, there was a real woman or a real man. They were different, um, and so the actual female versus the actual male some of them were negative, some of them were positive, but they were, but they were equally distributed across across genders. So teaching doesn't, uh, you know, service. Okay, so so yeah, women are really good at service. Um, it turns out that faculty service laws and gender 
if you're asked to be on a committee, women will often say yes. Women are asked a lot because the institutions are trying to achieve gender balance on committees, as they should, but that increases the, the burden for women. And this study showed that, um, on average, women perform significantly more service than men, controlling for rank, ethnicity, field, department. And in reality, doing a lot of service work doesn't actually help you get promoted. They're not going to punish you for doing service work, but because you're not doing research while you're doing service work, in fact, you, there's a there's a negative um, cost to to doing to doing service. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, what about life after tenure? So you think once you get tenure, it's all good. Um, and it is good, <laughs> uh, but it's not as good for women as it is for men. <laughs> so this is um, gender disparities in uh, invited commentaries in, on, uh, in journals. And one of the interesting things was that women are asked to do invited commentaries far less than men, but that's actually, it gets worse the older the woman is. And usually the older the woman is, the more senior she is. So what you see over here is that both um, as women age, I mean, first of all, there's a difference across the board, but older women are asked, uh, and more senior women are asked to do commentaries even less compared to men than younger women and more junior women. Okay, so these are, com compared to what it could be, these are, are bad, but they're relatively benign compared to the experience of some young women um, scientists. This is Katie Book Booman who was all over the news a few, I think within the last year, because when people took the first photograph of a black hole, uh, her that picture of her looking so really excited seeing it got taken and distributed and all, got all over the press. Um, she was part of a team of almost 200 people who worked on this project, um, but she had done a, a lot of the work along with a number of other, you know, these are these science papers that have 500 authors and the top 10 or 20 or maybe 50 have done a ton of work on the project. But the outpouring of anger about the fact that she was the face of this project on the internet was really overwhelming. Um, comments like this, that, you know, woman does 6% of the work, it's 100% of the credit. Um, think about how men like Andrew Child, who did all the work, Andrew Child writes, Back. So apparently some, I hope very few people online are using the fact that I'm the developer of some imaging to launch awful and sexist attacks on my colleague. This woman ended up getting death threats on the internet because she had a picture taken as the face of a person who had done some really extraordinary work. So I think most of us are um, hopefully immune from that. But there is a really, um, there is an undercurrent of some really hostile, some real hostility. That's not just kind of like, oh, well, it's, it's not, it's not <laughs> worth it for us to make sure that women and men's salaries or startups are equal. This is, you know, it's much deeper and I don't know what it reflects, but it's not, it's not good. Um, uh, how about for me? So um, I, you know, I, I did get tenure and uh, things did change. It turned out, it kind, of was, it kind of undermined my talk, but I went back and thought, you know, like, like a lot of women, I, I just don't want to say something that's not true, so I check it and double check it and triple check it. And I thought, well, I was saying that I wasn't very productive in my first years compared to the men, and I absolutely believed that. And then I went back to look and counted how many papers my, other, my colleagues published in exactly the same period. There were these two guys who started when I did. I published about four papers a year for the first five years. My, um, my colleague, who I thought was like a superstar, published five papers a year for the first five years. And my other colleague, who I thought was a superstar, published three papers a year for the, for the first five years. So it really wasn't all that different, although I honestly believe until last weekend, <laughs> that it was. <laughs> for me, the, the biggest thing that um, contributed to my ability to actually improve my productivity after that and um, have my career take off is that I had a partner who really gave up his career uh, for my career. Um, so my husband was a musician. As I said, when we started, when we had kids, he realized he just couldn't do this. He went back to um, public health school, not because he loved public health, but because he wanted to find a career where he could both um, help us, support us financially, 
and where he would be home um, more. So if, if needed, he'd be there with, with kids. And he, you know, it, it made a huge difference in my life. Um, he, I'm really happy to say that in the last couple of years, he's gone back to being a full-time musician. And I feel like, who, you know, <laughs> that kind of, uh, you know, things that kind of turn around for all of us. But without that, there is absolutely no way that I, I would have um, been able to uh, not to do what I did. Uh, I also had two, so a couple of really strong supporters. So Barry Bloom was the dean at the School of Public Health when I first started as a faculty member. But before that, he'd been in New York, um, being a uh, professor and working on TV. And I had been in touch with him when I started to get interested in TV. And he was a hugely supportive through my whole career. But what I particularly remember was, I, I, at this point I just had the two kids, but my, my son was probably one. And he invited me to come to New York and work at his lab to learn how to do molecular typing of TV strains. And I don't know if I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I can leave my family. I don't, I don't even remember saying anything. But he said, and we'll put you up at this little bed and breakfast with your family. And he paid the bill. Um, so my whole family came and stayed at, stayed at a little inn while I learned how to do molecular epi. I mean, it was kind of amazing. And um, I, it, you know, that was the beginning of a lot of ways in which he supported me by putting me in front of people who came to visit, you know, um, making sure I was seen. And without that, I really, I don't know how it, how it was done. And then, you know, Paul has been extraordinary, um, making lots of opportunities available to me and to, to many of our faculty that wouldn't otherwise be. And I'm thinking back to that startup issue. My, um, when, I, when I mentioned that they didn't ask us, like, what do you mean? What, it turned out what I needed, and I think a couple of other people in this room needed, was a basic biosafety lab in Lima, where we do most of our um, uh, epidemiologic work. And there is one, uh, the Socios and Salud Runs. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any of us would have been as successful academics without that lab. The lab does all of our typing. It does all of our drug resistance testing. It's now doing some pretty elaborate stuff. And that has fueled a lot of the work that came out of there. Harvard did not pay for that lab. That was not part of our startup arrangements. But it was something that was obtained through um, Partners in Health with Paul's help. Right? So without that, I, I can't imagine um, how we would have been able to do the work that we did. Uh, and that uh, was a, a, a way that, our, that he really supported our careers. Um, and that's the kind of help you actually need to get things done. I also had uh, an amazing access to amazing students. So this is just a spattering of really, um, you know, I couldn't put the my studies on this, on this slide. But because it's Harvard, you know, you get a lot of great graduate students. Um, I'm sure there are great graduate students in lots of other places. But uh, the graduate students are really what has kept the research going. And a lot of these but former graduate students have gone on to faculty positions and are now colleagues, and it's, it's been really great. OK, so this is a little bit of a downer, this talk. Um, <laughs> uh, what should we do? What can we do now? Um, one thing that has already happened is really important is that the Massachusetts has passed the Equal Pay for Comparable Work Act, which is a really, really good thing. And I, you should know about it. You should know that there's a couple of things that it ensures. <coughs> Men and women are supposed to, by law in the state, be paid for the same for equal work. And that can be adjusted for seniority, for training, and for you know differences in what they actually do. But if a man is doing the same work as a woman, or a woman's doing the same work as a man, the woman needs to be paid the same amount that the man is. Um, otherwise, you know, you're breaking the law. Uh, one of the stipulations here is you can't lower a man's salary to make it equal to a woman's. So <laughs> men, you know, it's like it's not, uh, men are not going to suffer. Men who already have a particular salary are not going to suffer by this um, move towards equality of income. Um, you, employers may not prohibit employees from discussing or disclosing their wages. So in the past and in other states, Employers will tell you that you can't share information about your salary or your benefits with others because then they'll want what you have. And if you've been following the news, 
there have been huge disparities between, say, BBC um, anchor women and men, and uh, there's been a number of suits over it. In this state, that's absolutely illegal, and you can't put, have somebody sign a non-disclosure agreement or something like that. You that you cannot tell them, and that includes your startup package. So, I, I don't know how often it happens. I've heard rumors where people have said, "Oh, don't you know? Don't tell your startup package, because other people will want the same amount of money." They can't actually say that. I mean, they they, they can, but it's in, in principle it's illegal. Um, you can't ask people their previous salary. So when you're hiring someone, you can't say, well, women were paid less before, so we can continue to pay them less now. You have to, you can't ask at all. So you should be, as employers, if you're in that position, be aware that that, that uh, is, well, is against the law. Um, and you can't retaliate if somebody actually calls you out on, um, or someone exercises their rights. There's a lot to this law, and you should look at it. Um, Pay transparency. So there's a big debate. This was a, a, a article that came out in the New York Times um, saying that pay transparency works in terms of closing the gender gap around pay. So meaning if people just tell everybody else what they make, then women will find out. You know, that, that if men make more than they do, they'll find out. It also said that it actually increases the happiness of people who make a lot of money and decreases the happiness of people who don't make a lot of money. Um, and so from an institutional perspective, it, it might not be the greatest thing. Uh, and it's true. You know, if you find out that you think you were all living happily together and that somebody else who's doing exactly what you do makes a lot more money than you do, you're usually pretty unhappy about it. Um, but I feel like it's a, it's a step we're all going to have to go through in order to kind of get past it. Um, so I, I feel like there's reluctance around uh, this, not only because people are kind of embarrassed about sharing, but because they know it's going to make people unhappy. And it is. Uh, but, but that's the only way things change. Solidarity is a really important thing. Um, it happens by chance that uh, our core is mostly women. And it's a <laughs> extraordinarily supportive group. And um, I think that when one works directly with a lot of um, junior faculty who are women, these things become really obvious. And it becomes it's easier for me to fight on behalf of Bethany's maternity leave than it, than it was for me to fight on behalf of my own um, back when I, I had to do that kind of thing. And then I think we just have to raise our voices and speak out. Um, I like this because it looks like there's lipstick on that, that, those lips, but, <laughs> but even if there's not, uh, I think we just, you know, we have to, to discuss these things openly, no matter how painful they are, and um, and talk about them, which is why I'm here spilling my guts. And I'm kind of a private person, and I don't really feel like comfortable telling you all you know, the intimate details of my life. But, um, but we have to do it. So uh, we have probably only a few minutes for questions uh, or discussion. I think discussion is better than questions. But uh, anybody have anything to add? <laughs> I think this has been wonderful, Molly, and I will perhaps spoil it, at least in <coughs> part one, by underlining what you said. At my class at Harvard Medical School, we had a Saturday morning presentation at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, one Saturday, the presentation was of a patient with a hernia. And the person who made the presentation was the chairman of the urology department at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. When patient was presented, the chairman said to the class, uh, gentlemen, because they were only men, and they were only gentlemen, of course, <laughs> in this class, this is the last time I can make this presentation. 
my colleagues in their wisdom yesterday had a meeting at the Brigham, but all the chairs of all the departments at Harvard Medical School. And they decided in their wisdom that from starting with next year, women will be in admitted to the Harvard Medical School. You can see why I will never be able to present a patient with a hernia again. <laughs> Needless to say, this was not a female patient. That's my contribution. <laughs> To the problem. Later in my career, I became a dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. And when I made it clear that there was no such thing as a difference in gender, I had some criticism made of me by faculty members. But the general response was, in effect, of course, and you can prove it with your salary structure. I think I did. <laughs> but it was not widely proven, and I'm afraid we still have a distance to go. Thank you. Thank you. I was gonna say, as a 47-year-old uh, graduate student who has been in the field of, of international assistance and global health and emergency since my early 30s, I have always been highly criticized because I've always asked for more money because I've worked my butt off in the jobs I've had. And I've always been told, but you don't have children. You're not married. Why should you make the same amount? And in the environment of the United Nations, when I was with UNICEF, when you're in the peace system, et cetera, everything is public information. Everyone knows exactly how many per diems you got, et cetera. And for the two, two to four years that I spent between a consultant and working with UNICEF in the Congo, not a week passed without someone saying to me, but why should you make that much money if you don't have a family to take care of and stuff. And it's it drives me crazy. Even today in Haiti, some of my colleagues are like, you know, why do you make so much money? You know, which is hilarious because I think I should make more. But uh, <laughs> ultimately, um, for the younger people in this room, don't let that get to you. Continue to fight for what you think is worth. And don't let other people get you down in that sense because ultimately, it's you, you have to decide what your worth is. This, uh, kind of to throw it out to the universe, but then also would love your thoughts on this. Something I think about a lot, and something that's very palpable to me, is a point you highlighted around service. Yeah. And um, and I think it affects women in the sense that, um, you know, I sit and buy statistics. There's not that many women faculty or disproportionately fewer women faculty. And if they want every student who comes through the door for prospective students, we, we get to meet a woman, then we have to see more <laughs> students. Um, I think it affects women of color more than it affects women in general. And I, I'm very conscious of that. So I've seen this concept floating around. And, and I have to say, I see it here as well, like when you look at who shows up for the mentorship yeah. meetings and whatnot. So I've seen this concept float around of the diversity tax of certain groups of faculty are asked to give more, yeah. mm -hmm. but are not compensated, mm -hmm. and that what they're asked to give is not valued. And it seems like there could be a monetary compensation attached to some of these things. And so your thoughts or other people's thoughts on the existence of this and how we could help address it, yeah, I'd love to have more RAs to buy out some of my time that I spend on committees and meeting with student, prospective students. And 
No, it's a it's a real problem. I think you know I was thinking about a couple of I'm on the faculty council and there's a lot of men on the faculty council, but in the subcommittees where the work's done, both of the subcommittees I'm on are almost entirely women. Um, it's it's true, uh, and it's especially true because if the, the schools are trying to achieve diversity to make sure that people are represented, but there's so few especially women of color, that that means that they're asked to do a huge amount of service that they would not, you know, way beyond um, what both their male and white counterparts would do. So I don't know what the answer is, because we really do need those voices, um, but they can't come at the cost uh, for that person's career, and it hasn't really been thought through carefully. So I have a question about, um, about the words and the, and, the, and the gendered words that are used in papers and grants and whatever. I, I know that I... I Terrific. <laughs> couldn't agree more. Um, what, what, what would you advise? Because I know that I, you know, like we're, right now we're in the, in the core, we're in the space of re, re not negotiate, but rewriting our, our presence online. And I find that the presence that was written for me, I'm very uncomfortable because it talks about Dr. Miller's teams, Dr. Miller's teams. Dr. Miller's one member of the team. Right. It's not Dr. Miller's team. How do how do we navigate that? How do we navigate that language? Do we use those? Like what would you advise? So what I have advised right, is somewhere in between the so, so I think about people who, when I've helped people write grants, um, I'll often take language that seems overly technical to me and try to make it more lively because, and a lot of, I'm talking about helping women write grants. And one particular person, I used to say, you, you, you gotta like, you know, inject, and you, the enthusiasm you actually feel has gotta be injected into this grant because <coughs> it reads very technically. But it's the same kind of spirit that made me go back and check exactly how many, you know, how many papers people have written. Because I think women are much more nervous about saying anything wrong, right? Like I went to a talk years and years ago where they said, you, know, you go to a, a woman's um, talk and it's like, I absolutely believe that two plus two is four. I mean, some people might think it's five. But I really, really believe it's four. And here's why. You know, where, where guys are just not doing that. <laughs> yeah, and that seems silly, right? It seems like we don't we don't need to go there. On the other hand, um, and I do think that it's true that this use of this language, I remember at one point I was, uh, um, Eric Lander was a co-author of one of a paper that we wrote, and he called us all in to have a Saturday, you know, hardworking guy, a Saturday afternoon meeting to write the paper, and he helped us write the letter to the editor, you know, the submission. And it was like, here is why this is novel. Here's why it's got the words unique, robust, robust. I would have never used those words. I mean, I'm just, I, you know, there's things I just can't. No matter how much I squeeze, I can't get those things out, right? Because it's just ingrained. But I do think there's a, a happy medium where um, we we don't need to be as defensive and write as defensively as we do. That we tend to think, oh, if women are you know, if there's a higher standard for women to get funded, that the way to deal with it is to be 100% sure instead of 98% sure. And then that comes across in ways that sometimes aren't as compelling as the, you know, 98% sure, but with a little bit of hype. So I totally agree. I mean, I, I think there's, the, the trick here is to find language that you believe is true, because you can't possibly say things about yourself that aren't true, but, you know, which are brought to life by, um, you know, storytelling, narratives, things that, you know, you would probably do perfectly well outside of the context of writing mm -hmm. the grant. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for the lecture. I have a question. Uh, there's November was the conference leader in Global Health in Kigali. And yeah. I assisted to a panel where four women, women, four surgeons, two from Africa and two from the uh, USA, talk about how it's to be surgeons. I'm surgeon too. And uh, I was so disappointed and uh, so I disagree with them because all or women uh, think that uh, talk for the, for the people, for all the women in the, in the conference uh, and uh, thought that to be a surgeon, a female surgeon, you have to be the best, the best. And I think it's so wrong, it's really it's a wrong message to, to give to the young woman at the conference. What do you think? I think 
it, it is important to do the best for me. <laughs> but it's impossible to tell for other people that I am the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's the one lines we're now saying is that uh, when you get into that mode where you think the, the bar is higher for you, that, that some of the things you do to try to prove it are, are actually self how self harming, not only for your career, but just for your life. Right? It's like if you really think that you can't have a life and you know you, you have to work you know 80 hours a week instead of 60 hours a week or 40 hours a week, what, okay, so what does, one of the things I feel like I've learned in my old age is that you can get a lot done working fewer hours by using those hours well and by actually not being exhausted all the time. I mean, I think that the exhaustion quotient is huge. It takes a huge toll on how productive you are by the hour. And it's really challenging to think originally or creatively when you're tired and overwhelmed by something. And so um, there's a lot, of, a lot of work out there. I've been looking at some of the neurobiology around this. I actually think working a little bit less and not um, having the, the super high standards improves the, your, your work product. And you can find the place by kind of backing off and seeing where, where it goes. But, it's, but those messages are, are what's driving people to overwork and to overperform and to write these kinds of sometimes overly technical and sterile grants. And you know, the reality is that, that men, and you know, I hope this isn't negative about men, but I think it's great, you know, don't feel as defensive and therefore can write more freely. And that comes across as, as sometimes a more compelling message. Um, I want you to go back to Liz's point, and I want you to uh, speak more on negotiation skills, um, especially like for women in developed um, uh, low resources countries. Like if you are a woman, if you are local people working in, with an international organization, it's going to be like hard to negotiate with someone. So how, how well, I want you to speak more well, on this. Well, okay. So I have to confess, I'm really bad at negotiation skills. <laughs> <laughs> and I really would like to learn how to do it. I think there are places to learn. I think there's, there's consultants out there and there's training courses that help, right? One of the things I found helpful, and I, I don't you know, I wish it weren't helpful, is to know what, you know, to actually get information. So when I was, a couple of times when I was a junior faculty, I would know from my friends who are men what, what their experience had been. And then when my turn came, I could, they'd say, like, for example, I, I think two and a half, three years into it, my the school said, oh, we're taking back whatever you didn't spend on your, on your startup. They were for three years only. They hadn't told me it was for three years only. And I said, no, really? And then I asked them with the guys that I worked with. I said, did they take back your startup funds? And they said, no, they didn't. Mm -hmm. So I went back and said, OK, so really? You're going to take away my startup funds, but you didn't take away the startup funds of these guys? And they go, OK, wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can have them. <laughs> you know, so I think you know, this is where transparency becomes really important. <clears throat> so if you can, you know, if men will share with you what, what happens with them, that's a very good negotiating point. Um, I, I think we have to learn how to do this. And I've had a number of uh, women, friends, and, and colleagues who are beginning to take on leadership roles, and they explicitly go out and train how to do it. And mm -hmm. I think that that does help. It's worth, it's worth our doing. It's worth learning how to do it. There's like one more sort of, this is, a, this is a kind of a thorny thing, but it's about, um, it, it, it's, it's about, it's about, promoting this and also engaging our, our assorted male compatriots in this. Like how, how, how do we talk about this without make, uh, maybe it doesn't matter, but without making everyone like, That's it. yeah, feel like the, the, I, the, like here's, here's your privilege, look at your privilege. You know, like, well, I mean, it's not, it's not you know. men's faculty's fault. It's not. Women are no. less than men. Yeah. It's, they're certainly not promoting it. In yeah. fact, if anything, you know, the, the I, I think most people would be much more comfortable in an environment where people were paid equally. I think, so, you know, I don't know who the culprit is. I think when the school, I'm not talking this school, but yeah. the, the, so, some institution Academia. looks at their funds yeah. and they say, okay, we can achieve equity. You know, there's, some, there's generations, decades of pay inequity that have happened. We could bump everybody's salary up so that they would be equal. It would cost us tens of millions of dollars and we don't have that money. So maybe we should just ignore it for now. Right? And, um, you know, I understand that. If you're, if, you know, if you don't have the money, <laughs> 
then you don't really know what to do. But this isn't the solution to it, by having men and women pay different, different amounts. But that, I think, is what's driving a lot of people's kind of reluctance to talk about it or deal with it, is that they, they don't want to get a, a $10 million bill, right, mm -hmm. for the difference between making women's startup packages the same or, or equal. And um, so what to do about that? I mean, I think it's going to be slow. I think that recognizing where they're coming from without actually agreeing that it's okay is something we need to do. And then say, yes, we know it's going to be costly. Let's talk about where that could come from. I don't, I don't know where it's going to come from. But, um, you know, I think acknowledging that we recognize that other men faculty are not at fault, um, and even people making decisions might not be at fault if they're under financial constraints that uh, seem, you know, you know, overwhelming to them. But but reminding them that you know it's just it's just not reasonable to function in a um, in an inequitable uh, system. But Matt, um, is it possible for salaries to be more transparent? Like, I mean, a public university is a public institution. Public information and, and things won't explode, you know. Like people just get on with it. Yeah. Not like um. Well, also, you know, we're like mm -hmm. like it's, the whole, everything about negotiation no. is about leverage and right. understanding your cards. And um, and so if, like it seems like the first step is just understanding, you know, is, is the transparency. Is that is that a possible? Is that possible? Does that scare you, Jen? I think it will do exactly what it says in the New, in the <coughs> New York Times article. It will make right. people who are paid less very unhappy yeah. and people who are paid more happy. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's it's not only the fact that I'm paid less, uh, if I am, but, you know, I'm not saying that I am, but, if, but in the times when I have been or when I found out that my start package was much less or when I found out, you know, what real salaries are for doctors and stuff, when I think this information, it, it's taken a little psychological insight, right? It's not just that I'm, I need the money and, you know, it doesn't seem fair. It's kind of like I almost didn't want to know, right? It's like there's something just your heart says. Like, do people really value me less than my male colleagues? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just like, it's, it's kind of a, what do you call it, gut punch, right? It, it's, it's, so there's, you have to kind of separate that part out from what you actually need. Like, you need money or you don't need money. But that piece where where you feel devalued is, is a kind of you know psychological thing as well as, as not. So I think I think it'd be great. I think pay transparency is absolutely essential. I'm not sure if Harvard's going to, to take it up, but it is going to cause some pain, right? And it's going to pay on both sides. Um, and so you know I think we have to kind of steal ourselves for the fact that oh my God, when you find out, I was in a I was in a van last summer, a couple summers ago, where an assistant professor who was a mentee of mine at one of the hospitals was talking about her salary negotiation with her boss. She's a dermatologist. And so in the car were two senior faculty members, me and a guy who I was with, both pretty successful. And it turned out her salary was higher than ours. <laughs> and she was saying, asking us for advice on how, and say hers was the lowest in her department, and how could she get her hot hat in her Wow. Our mouths are still open, like, oh no, she's lower than the guys, you should ask for it, but we're looking at each other. Like, and you know, it's the same kind of thing, like, oh my god, really? <laughs> you know? And she was mostly a researcher. And so we were like, oh, we, 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 I had a tax guy tell me I was in the wrong field many years ago. He said, well, hey, aren't you a dermatologist? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, but, but it's a kind of shock, you know, and, and you almost don't, you know, you almost don't want to know. But, but yes, you should know. And you should, just like you should steal yourself for the fact that there's going to be a coronavirus pandemic and start thinking about it now, <laughs> you should steal yourself for the idea that when you find out, you're not going to be happy about it. You know? Yeah. So is it not conceivable here that people should have the same salary, like depending on rent? Like, like in England, like in research at least, there's, everyone has the same starting salary and not negotiating. Well, I, so I think the way, okay, I can't speak for the school, and I don't think it's very nice to speak for the school, um, but what I understand, and I might be wrong, uh, is that they're, they're, they try to achieve salary equity within departments. 
right? So then you kind of say, well, well departments, and, and that sort of is what it is, right? Interestingly, you know, departments are, that have more women in them, the salaries tend to be lower than the salaries of, than departments that have more men. And so um, could they, they, they would claim they couldn't because they'd, they'd say, you know, that job, the, well, back when I was on the, after Larry Summers made this declaration about men and, not, and a number of other things about how women couldn't do science, there was a big outpouring. I was on a committee over at the, at the um, university at, at Cambridge. Um, and, uh, you know, women, the science and math professors get paid more than the humanities professors do. And they said, well, that's because they're, they're going, you know, the, the, the competing jobs that they could get pay more and they need to keep them in academics rather than have them go to industry. But an English professor doesn't have a job in industry, so they can pay that person less. Um, it didn't look like it from that from that graph, so I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the reason I'm up here saying all this is so that somebody you know thinks maybe we could have <laughs> some equality. I yeah, you know, I, I uh, otherwise I'd rather not be here. <laughs> yeah, Juan. Yeah, to me it's really interesting talking about like how do us as men sort of get involved in this conversation. You know, like, I've gone to countless conferences where this talk happens in the women in insert any discipline kind of panel, instead of happening, like, as an actual conversation in the main room or in, in these bigger spaces. And while, like, these affinity spaces are important to have conversations, right, but folks really understand your experience, like, I think we need to have these conversations more and more often and be really intentional about sort of having them in the halls of power, not just yeah, it's a really good point. And you know, I, I when I was working on this, the first time I was really, it, it, it was kind of depressing. I mean, I, you know, I had no idea. I hadn't looked at this data. And so, you know, I'm not sure if it's worse to think it's your own experience and nobody else's, or to realize that it's a really systemic issue. But I, I was shocked by, this, by this, these papers and these studies. Um, uh, probably shouldn't have been, but but it was. I think we have time for one more question. Any last thoughts? Any last thoughts, Megan? Uh. <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs>